time. Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Jeremy Oma, and I work for Article 19 Eastern Africa. Um, I'll probably allow my colleague to introduce herself first, then we can get into it. Also, another colleague of mine is on the way. I think uh, he'll, int he'll introduce himself when, as soon as he gets here. Thank you. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Minayo. Thank you so much for coming to our session. I work at Kenya ICT Action Network. We are an ICT policy think tank that is based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I'm very interested in the topic because I believe that data unlocks a lot, but also it can be an area where, if not well regulated, can lead to further human rights uh, violations. So I'm grateful for this panel and I await questions from Jeremy. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I'll probably start with a brief overview of um, what um, this session is about. Um, so in essence, we, um, we have done some research, um, basically a brief, uh, uh, very brief brief um, by Article 19 Eastern Africa. As I've said, I work with Article 19 Eastern Africa, um, an INGO. We work on um, issues of freedom of expression, association, assembly, both on online and offline spaces. Um, so specifically for this session, we have this brief uh, produced as part of the Our Data, Our Voice project supported by the GIZ Digital Transformation Center in Kenya. Um, and the paper uh, basically provides an overview of the processing of sexual orientation and gender identity data specific to the Kenyan context. Um, we'll also focus a bit mostly on um, matters the LGBTQ people who face heightened privacy and discrimination risks in comparison to cisgender and um, populations basically in Kenya. So what we hope to do with this paper is to increase awareness of data protection by different stakeholders in Kenya, be it um, regulators, be it activists, um, and the general population. Um, <coughs> and by doing this awareness, people get to understand their rights. Uh, that's for whoever is part of the community. Um, that's one. Two, um, people also understand the obligations that be it data controllers, data processors, um, and adhere to these uh, data protection laws, building the trust needed in the data economy, and promoting everyone's exercise of the freedom of expression and access to information. So um, I'll briefly go into some of the findings that we had before we get to um, some questions with them. Um, with my colleague here. Um, let me briefly go into some of the findings. So um, as I've said, um, briefly some of the findings. Um, one is the insufficient legal protections for LGBT people, especially in the Kenyan context. Most, uh, most laws, uh, or rather the, the practice is outlawed, not being um, identifying as LGBT in the country, that, but the practice or the action is, is outlawed. Um, so this has negative impacts on disclosure of this kind of information, sexual, sexual orientation or gender identity data, uh, disclosure and collection, especially, um, for example, be it a hospital, be it in banks, um, and the legal frameworks doesn't provide protection for from discrimi this discrimination. Um, there's a blanket um, protection for everyone that we equal under the law, but there's no specific um, protection for uh, from this kind of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, that's one. 
um, plus the social the social cultural context continues to have a great impact on the on the treatment of uh, sexual and gender minorities in the country. We have this uh, this thing that we keep throwing around that it's not our culture that's thrown around by by government by leaders. Um, so it's a not not a very good um, environment. That's one. I think the second finding is about this differentiated treatment of SOGI data under the under the legal framework currently in place. Um, so sexual orientation is classified as and processed as sensitive personal data, but gender identity is um, is classified and processed as a, as personal data. So one is sensitive personal data, the other is um, a general uh, data under Section Two of the Data Protection Act, which covers um, data the mostly of most um, things under under data protection in, in the country. Um, so in effect, this means that data contro controllers and processors processing this kind of data must differentiate and accord higher levels of um, protection to sexual orientation data, despite gender, gender identity also exposing um, data subjects to, to similar risks and consequences. Um, that's finding number two. Number three is restriction of SOGI data collection to legally ca recognize categories in both public and private sectors. Um, so in the country most if you go, for example, to a bank, to a hospital, um, and you need um, to collect data, the categories are majorly male, female. Sometimes they'll say intersex, sometimes they'll just put other. Um, so this is basically attributable to the failure of the law to recognize other, other gender identities, uh, sexual orientation, and this kind of, um, this kind of people. Um, so this paper was guided by some contributions from key stakeholders. Uh, we did some, some key informant interviews. We had some focus group discussions with key industry players um, in the country specific to Kenya. Um, so yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave that as the key f very key findings, but we also have some other findings and then go to some of the conclusions we drew and then some recommendations. Then after that, we can, we can speak to my, uh, my colleague and have a brief overview of the, the current situation. So, um, I'll go straight to some of the recommendations, specifically for one, data controllers and processors. I've divided it into two. So we have recommendations for data controllers and processors, and the second is, let's call it the civil society. So um, one for data contro controllers and processors is basically around compliance. So all public, private um, organizations and, and individuals processing personal data are required to register with the, let's call it the regulator, not regulator, but we call it the ODPC, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner in the country, as stipulated under the Data Protection Act. So we encourage that for anyone that is processi processing data, be it um, government, be it um, a hospital, be it a business that you require to process, to process data. Uh, recommendation number two is um, to implement uh, technical and organizational measures for compliant data processing of this kind of data, this kind of sensitive data, um, including doing a, a data protection assessment, a data protection impact assessment prior to processing and um, processing this kind of data and also engaging these, uh, these communities. That's one. Um, to appoint a data protection officer uh, to oversee compliance with the, with the laws, that's the Data Protection Act and other relevant uh, privacy and, and data protection laws, that's two. And for entities in the public and private sectors uh, to basically prepare or update data protection policies and notices so that they are up to date with, um, with the needs of the, of the community. Um, 
final is basically awareness and that is internal awareness for um for these um these entities to have a privacy aware culture so that you are aware of what you need to do when processing this kind of data and how to handle that kind of data in the right way um i think i'll go to the very last group this is for basic um the civil society these are the civil society actors is one to build in internal capacity and undertake training to to one understand the frameworks of data protection uh, the impact it has on the communities we work with um, and two is also once you have this knowledge you engage the public and private sector enter entities to also uh, create awareness for them to understand uh, the impact this processing has to understand um, what are the obligations under the the, the laws um, and finally is to advocate for the data protection commissioner to expressly include gender identity as a form of uh, sensitive personal data um, in in light of the risk of significant harm that may be caused by by, by the processing to data subjects um, it's also important to have this captured by the data protection commissioner and acknowledged and have frameworks to to protect this kind of data that's number two and finally is uh, is to advocate for uh, better laws to re to remove the, anti the the discriminatory laws whether it's repealing them or amending them to be in line with them um, with international standards so yes those are the kind of key findings and some of the recommendations we have in this um, in this brief um, I think I'll go to if it, if anyone has any questions up to that point I'll happily take them before we go to to my to my colleague then we can have a discussion about um, other experience in the country yes please So um, from your presentation, it seems that uh, there's like a, you know, a kind of embedded contradiction, which is that on the one hand, uh, the diverse gender identities are not recognized, right, officially. Um, so, but at the same time, there is that risk of like if somehow, you know, banks and medical facilities. Uh, so that's kind of the focus of data protection. But in parallel, is there kind of a movement or a drive towards kind of having these recognitions, you know, formally, um, you know, instituted? I, is there, you know, again, like, is there a drive or a movement? Is there something happening in Kenya? Okay, yeah. thank you. I think that's, that's the only question. I think, yes, there's, there's a drive to do that. Uh, over the past couple of years, there's been, um, a drive to repeal a section of the penal code. Uh, I think it's two sections, 162 and 163, that criminalizes the, the act, not necessarily the person. In, in Kenya, the identifying as uh, diverse, it's not criminalized, but the act is what is criminalized. So once you're found, but most times the, the law is abused, people are denied um, registration for, for organizations they are denied, uh, but there's been some good precedent set. I think there's been a long court case going on between um, the regulator that, that um, uh, is it called the yeah. NGO board? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, there was a petition to the constitutional court to declare section 162 of the penal code to be unconstitutional based on the discrimination ground. That petition was not successful, and Section 162 is still operational in our country. So Kenya's um, policy around it is to act like they don't exist. So whenever they're asked about it, the government always says that that is not a priority 
for Kenya that we're a third world country and we have um, more development issues to be concerned about. So what uh, has helped Kenya and the LGBTQ community is that our constitution is very progressive. So the penal code is a relic of the colonial laws that we inherited from the British uh, sis governance systems. But the constitution is actually 2010, very new in terms of constitutional law practice, very, very new in constitutional making. And our constitution has the right to non-discrimination very strongly and the Bill of Rights, which enumerates human rights. So when LGBTQ organizations were being denied registration based on the penal code, they went to court and the court went up to the highest court, which is the Supreme Court. And um, the court uh, ruled that while what they're doing might not, uh, might, might be a violation of the penal code under section 162, they have the constitutional right to assembly and association and all that. And therefore, when the registrar of the NGOs refuses to register them, then they have contravened the constitution. So it's the robustness of Kenya's constitution, even on the right to privacy, under section one, sec, um, Article 31 of Kenya's constitution, and now the Data Protection Act, that you see a very progressive um, human rights outlook. But we still have this um, elephant in the room which is section 162, and you can see the contradictions. I hope that gives you an idea of what we are working with. Yes, Thank and, you. and to also mention that there's a lot of pushback from government. They are not, for example, in the petition, the, the registrar tried to say that you're not, you're not supposed to do this. Um, so there's a lot of pushback from government. They are not ready to, to have these conversations, so yeah. I think then, I hope that answers you. Thank you. Um, then I'll go straight to a couple of questions for my panelists here. Uh, the other one will arrive, I'm not sure, but he should be on the way. Um, so we can basically start looking at the legal framework for processing of, um, of data, not necessarily just um, um, sexual or gender, kind of um, data, but in general, what's, what do you think, um, or rather what's the, the framework governing this processing of data? Yeah, so uh, as I had stated earlier, it starts in our constitution, uh, the right to privacy, and then we have uh, international human rights commitments, uh, some of them you know them, the International Con uh, Covenant on Civil Political Rights, um, the African uh, Convention of Human and People's Rights. So these are the bases and the frameworks for the right to privacy. And then in 2019, we operationalized um, the Data Protection Act. Uh, like many other African countries, it is a replication of the EU GDPR, and that comes with uh, pros and cons. Uh, so some of the pros are that the GDPR provided a very good framework with a complaints handling mechanism, an independent office. I'll put independent in quotes because you can say it's independent, but who is appointing? Uh, so the uh, independence is a bit um, of a, I won't choose independent, I'll just say it has a body because the independence is questionable. So we have the Data Protection Act and it's, it's, it's a very elaborate framework and I'm not going to focus so much on the downsides other than to just say that uh, just like the EU legislation, we expect that when data is being transferred from Kenya to other countries, that there's enough safeguards to provide equal or similar protection for data that is being handled in the third uh, countries or the recipient countries. So I hope that answers it. Maybe we can now go to the sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so uh, I work in Kiktanet as a gender digital rights programs officer. And last year we also had uh, conversations around gender and data protection. And this conversation cannot be had without talking about sexual orientation and gender identity data. Um, just a fun fact, even before I, I, I delve into the Kenyan uh, ecosystem, is that there's a very progressive approach to data protection from the Southern African region. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, South Africa, what are they called, SADC, the, the, the regional block in South Africa, SADC, came up with a model framework for privacy law for the member countries that belong to it. And they, they put gender 
as one of the personal or, or sensitive uh, data. Yeah. So while Kenya just talks of sex, they talk about gender, and there's a difference. So when you just talk about sex, you're referring to biological sex, and this is what is assigned at birth. So you're male or female or intersex. But when you talk about gender, you're talking about someone's expression, and that might sometimes not um, align with their biological sex. So that's very progressive. I always try to talk about the sad model law because it took a different approach even from the GDPR, which is something we want to see more of regional blocks and countries taking their own approach to data protection in a way that makes mm -hmm. sense for them, but also in a progressive way, in a feminist way. Um, so I'd just like to mention that. So in Kenya, you will find that uh, gender identity is not specifically provided for under sensitive data. It is treated as just personal data, and that means that it can be processed, uh, one, when there's consent, and two, even when there's no consent, when the data processor or the data controller can prove that that information or that data is necessary for performing certain tasks. So they'll say, uh, you entered into a contract, and part of my obligation was to do ABCD, and that obviously means I have to process your data to do that. So that is, uh, uh, how can I say this? There is no consent necessary in certain aspects of personal data processing. How is this a problem? It is a problem because we can still see how gender data or gender identity identifiers can still lead to human rights violations. It could be job applications, it could be loan applications. So it could lead to further um, violations. Now for sexual orientation, I think we've already given you and um, we have set the scene for you to understand how sexual orientation is grappled with in our legal system, that it is a crime and the same crime is still protected in the data protection framework, which sends um, contradicting viewpoints. And it's not just sexual orientation data, it may, if I may add. Health data has also been one of the things we've grappled with um, because health data is dealt with in different, uh, is dealt with in different uh, frameworks. So there's our Health Act, which uh, empowers health practitioners to collect data necessary to perform their work. And at the same time, you're seeing that health data is sensitive data that cannot be processed unless certain safeguards are given. So this is something you'll keep seeing in countries where they pass the Data Protection Act, but don't review or reform the laws that existed before. So you end up with um, a very interesting set of laws, if I may say. Uh, so yeah, so when you have, um, when, when data is deemed sensitive, it means there's more safeguards towards its protection. You'll find that if there's no consent, then the, the data controller or the data processor must prove the necessity of taking this data and of collecting this data or processing this data. Again, that falls in data minimization, that we want you to only collect data that truly is uh, necessary for what you're trying to do. So what happens when you put sexual orientation data and gender identity data separately? Let me give you an example. Um, so you're saying sexual orientation data is protected, right? Uh, but gender identity data is not sensitive data. It can be processed in any other way. But when we create links between data sets, we can be able to tell that this is Angela um, or this is Jeremy. Jeremy is male, male or female. That is not protected, we can tell, male. Um, Jeremy is on a sex app that is for queer community. So that tells us that while Jeremy is male, we can tell that we can identify Jeremy's sexual orientation from the apps he's using. So we need to have a harmonized uh, protection framework that protects Jeremy both for his identity as male and his orientation as queer, or, and this is of course just for example purposes after this meeting, please don't <laughs> harass Jeremy. <laughs> but you get the point that uh, we need, a hum what, I ni what I like to say is we need an equilibrium or a spectrum of protection that cuts across and doesn't end and stop um, at a certain point. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. And you've preempted my next question about um, probably what is your experience with the, with the practice of processing of data, especially um, sensitive data. 
thank you and i think for for this talk to be important for the people in the room i'd really like to talk about processing of data in non-profit entities so for a long time we've been talking about data protection from oh it's just companies compliance actually i hate the word compliance but we have to use it but what the message it sends is regulatory and compliance that's what companies do non-profits comply how when they're sending financial reports to donors like Compliance is a very foreign word to non-profit entities. Yet you'll find non-profit organizations process a lot of sexual orientation and gender identity data, which if mishandled has serious human rights um, ramifications. So we need to understand data protection as something that applies both for non-profit and for profit uh, entities, the companies in this case. So you'll find even how we have conversations around data protection is Oh, big tech, and of course I understand why we do this, because those are the examples that make the most impact and the most sense to the people in the room. But uh, we also need to start talking about processing of data by non-profit en entities, because what will happen, for instance, if uh, a non-profit like Article 19, for example, you operate in Kenya, and Kenya is becoming maybe a draconian state, and the state can have access to your documents, do these organizations have a plan? Do they know how to uh, fight back when this data is requested from them? We keep saying, oh, Apple is such a good company because they will never comply with um, request for information from governments. Do we ask the same questions uh, when it comes to non-profit uh, entities? Uh, so I, I think it's very important to, to have those conversations of data protection, even from a non-profit um, point of view. So from, from practice, what is very worrying is this idea that data protection is a concern for companies and not a concern for non-profits, yet you will find the, the people who handle most of the sexual orientation and gender identity data, the people who, do, who are doing the research in these areas and collecting data in this area will be non-profit um, entities. Um, Another worrying practice I've seen from my country, I'm speaking from Kenya's perspective, and during the question and answer forum, I would like to invite you to give us perspectives from your countries, is that um, there are so many myths and misconceptions around data protection and processing. Um, I'll give you an example. So uh, last week, last month, let me just say last month, because I've lost uh, a sense of time, is that our Office of the Data Protection Commissioner issued penalties, pen penalty notices to three companies uh, for breaching the Data Protection Act. And one of the um, entities that was fined was a club, so like uh, a place people go to have fun, a party joint. And uh, they were taking photos of people who were taking part in, you know, so they, you know, in Kenya, for some reason, clubs have this um, obsession with taking photos of revelers having fun at their joint. I don't know why. I don't know if they feel like they won't make enough sales without, you know, it's a whole data minimization and necessity principle. Like, do you really need it? But they did, and they ended up being fined because um, the data subjects uh, complained about them to the Data Protection Commissioner. I'm also meant to understand that it's uh, it's not, um, we should not take it for granted that our commissioner can issue penalties. Apparently in some uh, jurisdictions, the investigative powers and the powers to give penalties are curtailed. So I just wanted to put that as a side note. And what the other clubs have understood from this penalty notice is to put emojis on the faces of the photos they take. And they did this immediately after the penalty notice. Like, that's how unserious of a country Kenya is. Like, I just, we, we use humor to get through. <laughs> it's a very tough place to live in, so. Anyway, the point is, uh, they think putting emojis on the photos is uh, complying with the data protection. It's that bad, exactly. So there's a very pedestrian approach to understanding data protection, because if we have um, applications that can remove emojis and de-anonymize um, the photos, then they have not complied with the Data Protection Act if they don't have the consent and the necessity if there's no consent and all that. So I'll just put, I'll end it at that, because I think it's a light note and it tells you what the problem we're dealing with. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, I'll, we'll take them at the very end. Um, I think I'll just throw a couple of more, a few more questions to you. 
um, kind of um, building or not you, uh, you've just highlighted, is there um, uh, some sort of um, worrying impact that you have seen from this kind of processing of, the, of sensitive data or just any data in general? Actually, I'll, I'll give an example of an activity we were doing um, in Kicktonet. So last year we were doing something known as a um, gender internet governance exchange under the Our Voices, Our Futures project by APC. And we had people from the queer community as part of the participants. And before we used to just work with women and we will take photos and post them, you know, part of the reporting, but also the social media campaigns. And they told us that some of them are closeted and putting their photos online in an activity that is clearly for queer people will put them at risk. I get comments that data protection should be some very, um, how can I say this? Now this is serious. This is about penalties of 50 million in the EU um, and Facebook and Meta uh, but that minimizes the harm that such data breaches can have on normal, ordinary people who are not celebrities, who are not in the EU, and therefore their complaints cannot attract the penalties that are in the European Union. So understanding that in the context of the stigma and even deaths we've seen in our country against queer people, that is a serious um, uh, risk we need to have in mind. I'll give another example of the homophobia we saw online once the Supreme Court made a ruling allowing LGBTQ organizations to be formally registered. So we had a lot of disinformation online and what people understood that ruling to mean was that uh, Kenya has formalized LGBTQ relationships, which was not even the case. Like. I was like, we wish that was the position. It is not. <laughs> it, it is not. Uh, and the homophobia, the, the, the messaging online was, we will kill them. We are never going to accept that. And I kid you not, it was not even just from people online. It was even from the leadership at the national level. So when there's this understanding that this is an undesired people among us, it also warrants hate or justifies hate or motivates and incites hatred against that group. So being queer on its own, existing as queer is a political act in Kenya and in certain other countries. So let me just end it at that. Okay, thank you. I think the final one should be um, probably, do you have any recommendations or insights on um, best practice? Um, for, for collection and the subsequent processing of this kind of data? Um, yes. Uh, first of all, I like Article 19 to actually publish the, the I just want to call you out here. <laughs> you need to publish this resource because they have annexed amazing templates that people can use when processing uh, data. Data protection is a very complex um, principle I have to always remind people when I'm talking about it, that it can't cover all the bases in one topic or in a 45 minute uh, panel session. But there's need for more resources, uh, not just for uh, for profit entities. Those ones have enough money to get the DPOs, to get the people to help them comply. But what happens to nonprofits whose resources are quite minimal? So what Article 19 has done is to come up with templates for nonprofits when they're, and it's like a checklist, which is what we need because this is such a complex, um, it's a complex process. So telling you, okay, you have this data, have you gotten consent? If you don't have consent, do you have the basis for it? Have you uh, documented? Uh, documentation is so important in data protection because uh, you need to also preempt what can happen in future. Will you ever need to provide proof of consent, for instance? 
uh, those are things we might not be thinking about, especially operating as non-profits. But those are that, that is the age of data protection we are in, that you need to be documenting consent, documenting contracts you have with data control, uh, data processors. So let me just explain this. Uh, sometimes you'll find there are two entities involved in the processing of data. So there's the data controller, the person who uh, collects and also directs how the data is going to be processed. And then you can have another entity being the data processor. So these ones are the ones who are going to store the data, anonymize the data, analyze the data, and all that. So um, they might have different functions depending on if they're a data controller or a data processor. So sometimes we use these words among people in the data protection field without explaining what the ramifications are. So uh, to make it in a more simple way is that a data processor is an agent or an employee of the data controller. So essentially, at the very end, the person who's going to be responsible for all the data protection issues, the breaches or whatnot, and consent will be with the data controller and not the data processor. So having them registered with the data protection entities in their countries is very important because it also um, gives them the justification for having budgets and all that towards compliance. Uh, so let's have this resource online, please, because I think for nonprofits is very important. Okay, thank you. And just a disclaimer: the the resource will be will be will be published by the the end of the way in October. So sometime in November, it will be fully ready. It's ready. It's just that we haven't yet published. There's a there's a whole process to go through, but uh, it will be published. And the main aim of the of the of this resource is to um, create awareness uh, about about data protection. So today we looked at some of the um, the challenges, the impacts that this processing has on on specific groups. But the paper looks at um, trying to create awareness about data protection and also some of the recommendations of best practices for data controllers, data processors, and also um, civil society actors in general. Um, so yeah, I think I'll, I might want to leave it at that, but um, I'll take some questions if there were any. We can take them um, at the same time. Then, yeah, we can end after that. Over to the we floor. Um, Okay. Hi, I have three questions. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I have many questions. Um, um, my first question has to do with the um, how um, data from sex workers is being um, saved and used and protected, right? Because we know that data from sex workers uh, tends to be more sensitive and uh, nonprofits also work with sex workers and maybe in Kenya that happens as well. So I would like to know uh, if there's a difference or if you have had any special remarks on the privacy of data for sex workers. Then my second question is how the um, uh, Anti-Homosexuality Act from Uganda has affected Kenya and the data protection laws um, in Kenya. And uh, my, th my third question is, how is it um, like for, uh, for you as civil society to work with uh, platforms in terms of platform accountability? Because we know we have the data protection laws, but how accountable are platforms in Kenya when, when you uh, register a report or an incident like how does it work, um, and also together with the police, right, with the judiciary system, how is it like there? 
So these are my three questions. Thank you. Any, any other question? Yes, please. Hi, this is more actually um, to clarify because um, when you're giving the example of the health data sharing um, scheme, so my, my clarification is, is there a health privacy act? Okay, and in that case, uh, when healthcare providers are getting the data, what is the sharing mechanism? Can they share with other, let's say one hospital um, is taking you as a patient, right? And if there is some kind of electronic health records, are they sharing and uploading to that repository? So it's shared across facilities, so every facility has access to that data. Is that how it works? Or every time they need to get ac you know, p uh, consent from the patient. Uh, that's one clarification. And second is that if there is a health, you know, health Privacy Act and then there's a Data Protection Act, uh, how does the coordination between the two work and what regime does the patient's privacy fall under, right? Are they covered un under the Data Protection or the Health Privacy Act? Thank you. Thank you. Is that the last question? Okay. Do you want to take any of the I questions? The, the health questions. Um, and your fifth question, possibility? Yeah, sure. And the hospital number. Okay, then take the two questions. Start with Pasha's question. And this is a topic I really like, so I hope you don't get passionate and talk too much. But yeah. So it's very interesting that you raised it because we are currently having a bill being tabled in government, in, in parliament, called the eHealth Act. So the eHealth Act um, is talking about telemedicine, but it's talking about protection of health data, which is very interesting. And I think um, people need to stop doing this. They, miss, they should just have called it the health privacy, because that's what it does. And it's providing a framework where first consent, uh, so collection will be consent based, and two is that there'll be sharing of data across uh, health facilities, and three, there will be uh, health identifiers. So they're also going to be assigning unique numbers to both patients and um, health facilities. And four, they want it to be portable, so they want to give that control of data to the patient, so the patient will be having the, all the records in a portable format. We don't know this portable format, but you know, data portability. And then they'll be able to, so it's still being debated, but that's what they have in mind. On how it is going to operate together with the act, you'll find most of the time saying, um, in the caveats for exceptions and things like that, if prescribed by any other law, or on the grounds if prescribed by any other law. So that is normally how we try to interlink laws so if it's talking about prescription by another law, we go to the other law or any other relevant law in question. I hope I've answered you, but you can talk about this after this. Um, the question on sex workers, again, sex work is also um, penalized in our country. So of course we understand that it's, the situation is different, uh, different places, but we also understand that sex work is also becoming digitized. So there's only fans and so many other, what are they normally called, webcam, uh, based uh, apps where they're still uh, part of the digital economy. And that also means that this data is being processed sometimes outside Kenya. Again, the level of awareness is low even on just data protection accountability in Kenya. So how bad can it be for a user based in Kenya whose data is being processed outside Kenya, i.e. in the EU? Those are questions and conversations we are yet to grapple with in Kenya, but I'm glad that Kiktanet is part of the OVOF project, and this could be um, part of the research we can conduct to understand how it's been dealt with. So I'll just give you new context for those two things. I'll let Jeremy go for the homosexuality laws in Uganda and how it's affecting Kenya, and the platform accountability. 
Okay, thank you. I think I'll start off with um, uh, specifically platform accountability. And just to mention, first of all, there's, um, th there's an ongoing case uh, at the moment between Meta and some of its, um, let's call them former content moderators. There's an ongoing case about um, matters around accountability. There was, um, there was an, let's call it good precedence, where they can now be held accountable for their actions within the Kenyan jurisdiction. Uh, but that case is still developing, but it's, um, it's good progress for us. We see it as good progress. Um, that was just uh, first of all, but there's also, um, from our point of view, there's, um, there's one of things uh, or two things we've tried to do. Um, first of all, there's, um, there's a coalition that we've tried to bring together around specifically content moderation. Uh, this is basically, um, we looked at some, some, we did some work around the current practices of content moderation in a couple of countries, but there's a specific um, uh, focus on Kenya. I'll talk specifically about Kenya. Um, basically understanding the experiences and challenges of Kenyans uh, around content moderation, takedowns and all that. Um, so some of the things that we, we found is um, platforms are amplifying, potentially am amplifying harmful content. Uh, there's lack of understanding of local context uh, because we are trying to have um, some sort of decentralization in terms of content moderation so that we can probably at some point hold them accountable for, um, for what happens on their platforms. Um, there's also insufficient transparency in content moderation. And finally, um, we are trying to bring together, sort of bridge the gap between the platforms and the local users. Um, so that's one of the things we do. So we are trying to have, time. okay, I'll keep it very brief. So um, we are trying to bridge, basically bridge the gap between local stakeholders or local users and the platforms to sort of get some kind of conversation going on how we can make the, the platforms better. Uh, so yeah, I think in, in the interest of time, there was a second question, Uganda. Um, for the case of Uganda, I think it's, it's very, it's not somewhere we want to be, but um, I think we've, we've recently been hearing cases of people being prosecuted based on this law. I think there's also some very bad cases but in Kenya, I think it's very similar, but not as bad. But um, I think in relation to how it has affected Kenya, I think there's been some... There's some potential legislation. So we have the culture bill. Yeah. It started family on as a family values protection bill. Yeah. Um, just to wrap up is that these are funded by Eurocentric, uh, far-right, evangelical radicals. And it's really sad. And it's not African, it's actually Western ideals being imposed on Africans. We'll end at that. Thank you so much for attending our session.